Hi friends, welcome back to the True Crime Corner with Mama Venus. I'm here to deliver your weekly dose of South African true crime. I hope you are having a good day so far. If not, please feel free to use this video to take your mind off things for a little while. Before we begin with this week's case, I would like to remind you to please click the subscribe button to support the channel and to easily access my videos. This week we are going to discuss the life and crimes of Pindile Joseph Njongwana, dubbed the X-Men. He's a former rugby player whose reign of terror lasted less than a week but brutally claimed four lives. Just like the famous X-Men of New Orleans, he attacked his victims at night or early hours of the morning. But Joseph focused on lone victims and he brought his own axe to their attack. Let's dive into the story. Between the 20th and the 23rd of March in 2011, an unknown ex-wielding man hounded the streets of Durban, looking to hack to death any random unsuspecting victims. On the dead of night on the 20th of March, he will find his first victim in Monte, a suburb located in the south of Durban. He is reported to have chased down this victim with an axe. Upon catching up to him, he hacked him to death. He then proceeded to cut his body into pieces. After he was done, he packed his axe into a plastic bag, got into his car, and drove off. The next night, he went out again looking for more victims. He went to hunt in the streets of Umlazi, where he attacked a man who fortunately escaped. It is reported, as he was attacking this man, he kept on accusing him of raping his daughter and infecting her with HIV. After this attack, I assume he did as the day before, packed his ex into a plastic bag, got into his car, and drove off. He would resume with his attacks on the next day, the 22nd of March, where he stalked and killed a man in Lamontville. According to a witness testimony, she had heard a hammering sound outside her house around 11 p.m. this night. Peeping through the curtains, she saw a large man chopping something. He would occasionally stop chopping to place whatever he was hacking into an orange bag. He would leave with this orange bag only to come back later with a white bag, chop some more and pack the contents into the bag. Even though the witness had not known what the large man was chopping, she had her suspicions that it was a human being. Her suspicions would be confirmed the next morning when the police attended the bloody scene. The attack is said to have been so brutal the victim's head was completely decapitated. His head is said to have been found in a rubbish bin a few hundred meters from his body. On the 23rd of March, he moved on and attacked another man in Umbilo around 3 in the morning. During this attack though, the killer was startled by a student who had been up studying at that time of the night. This student bravely screamed for the killer to stop, but it was too late. He had already murdered the man. After this attack, he would move on to attack and kill another unidentified man in Yellowwood Park. Also in the same week, he is reported to have gone back to Lamontville, attacked another man who fortunately survived. So in less than a week, he had brutally attacked six people, killing four and having two survivors. Police investigations into these attacks and killings were launched across the different areas. This killer appeared to be quite methodical and calculating attacking lone victims and using the cover of darkness to commit his crimes. As some of the attacks had witnesses, when asked to describe anything about the ex-wielding man, they described him as a big broad-shouldered man who drove a silver car. Luckily, some of the witnesses had been able to take down the number plates of the car. The color of the car and the plates would become a big break into this case. This led the police to a man who lived in Yellowwood Park, a quiet suburb in the south of Durban. On the 28th of March 2011, heavily armed police raided the suspect's home. During this raid, they found an axe in a dark kernel outside. It was still drenched in word blood. Inside his house, it is said that his bathroom still had blood stains all over it. This blood, though, was not visible to the naked eye. It could only be seen glowing in the dark after the police had applied a chemical called Blue Star. It was found in the shower the hand basin, and some on his bath towels. This indicated that the blood had been washed away. During their investigation, the police discovered no personal connections either between the victims themselves or between the victims and the suspects. 
there was no evidence of any of them knowing each other. While this was a shocking scene, the police were mostly shocked by the identity of the suspect, Pindile Joseph Njongwana, a 34-year-old well-known former professional rugby player. According to them, he was the unluckiest suspect for these attacks and murders. Joseph Dongwana came from an upper middle class family. He's said to have grown up in a stable and loving home and he had a great relationship with his parents. Both his parents were prominent people in society. His father is said to have also been a former rugby player, representing the South African rugby team, the Black Springboks, between 1972 and 74. After leaving rugby, he would become a government advisor and diplomat for the former Transcart and he later went into business. His mother was a former advocate and retired law lecturer at the Mangosutu University of Technology in Umladi outside Durban. There is not much out there on his childhood and his home life in general, but according to reports, until he got arrested on the 28th of March, there was nothing in his background that pointed to a serial killer in the making. His family described him as the kindest person they had ever came across. Joseph's rugby career came into the public eye when he started playing for the Blue Bulls team based in Pretoria. This was between 1998 and 2001. During his time with the Blue Bulls, he also represented the South African under-23 rugby team. He's said to have quit provincial rugby in 2002. The reasons behind this are not clear. His former teammates described him as a gentle giant and that he was quite a joker in the dressing room. After quitting rugby, Joseph went to live with his mother in Durban. As investigations into Joseph's life continued, the police discovered that the man was not a stranger to crime at all. On the 28th of November 2010, he had allegedly abducted a young woman in the Durban CBD and took her to his home in Yellowwood Park. This is where he held her captive for three days while raping her. While holding her captive, Joseph would accuse the victim of being unfaithful to him. This is despite them not knowing each other and not being in any kind of relationship. As a result of this, Joseph faced two charges of assault with an intent to do grievous bodily harm. Not long after this kidnapping, in December, he is said to have been involved in an undisclosed criminal activity. This led to a complaint being laid against him at the Durban Central Police Station but he was never arrested. Sources say that the decision to prosecute him was put on hold for this case because an arrangement was made for him to go for a mental assessment. The results for this assessment would only be disclosed to the police after he had been arrested for the X-Men murders. His first court appearance was in April 2011. He was charged with four counts of murder, two of attempted murder, one of kidnapping, one of rape, and one of assault. At this appearance, chaos was the order of the day, with the accused clutching a Bible in his left hand and pushing the police officers that accompanied him to the box. At his following appearances, he was a mean type security. It is not clear if it was at his first or second appearance when his lawyer handed over his psychological report to the investigating officer. These are the results of the assessment he had done in December 2010. With this medical report, the lawyer asked that his client be taken to further psychological observations. This is to determine if he was fit to stand trial and to meaningfully contribute to his defense. In June 2011, he was admitted to Fort Napier Hospital in Peter Maritzburg, where he was examined by a state psychologist and a private psychiatrist. Both the doctors declared him fit to stand trial. His trial was nothing short of drama, with his family butting heads with the community members and the accused claiming that he had no memory of any of the attacks and murders. He pleaded not guilty to all the charges against him because he did not remember himself carrying out any of the crimes. According to his family, Joseph suffered from amnesia and other mental illnesses. He had been diagnosed in 2009 and was admitted to several mental hospitals across South Africa. This includes Valkenberg Mental Hospital in Cape Town. After his stay in Valkenberg, he was released into the care of his family and he had to be presented for analysis by his doctors continuously. 
His mother told the court of the times when he would not remember things he knew. The family would further claim that Joseph was off his medication when the crimes took place, therefore was not in the right mental state. This was confirmed by a private psychiatrist testifying for the defense. The doctor said that people with this disorder behaved in a bizarre manner, thought they were taking protective action, had impaired judgment, and were overwhelmed by their impulses. The state psychiatrist would challenge this testimony. Even though they agreed that he suffered from schizoaffective disorder, they said that it was not so severe that he could not differentiate right from wrong and could not fully understand the wrongfulness of the alleged crimes. His mental illness was the central plank on which his lawyers used to lay down their defense strategy for Joseph. They said that he lacked criminal capacity. In addition to the medical reports, they quoted his bizarre behavior as an indicator of him not being in his right mind when he committed the crime, making examples of him accusing his rape victim for being unfaithful to him even though they did not know each other, and accusing his ex-victim for infecting his daughter with HIV even though he didn't have a daughter. However, the judge on the case found that Joseph was fully aware of his actions when he committed these crimes, and he was criminally responsible. The lawyers had not allowed Joseph to testify in his defense in court, and this counted against him during sentencing as the judge could not tell if he was remorseful or not. He was found guilty and handed five life sentences. He was sentenced to life for each of the four murders and one for rape, and 14 years in total for kidnapping, assault, and attempted murder. As the judge read out the sentence, he called Joseph a brutally savage and barbaric man who had little or no regard for human life. His legal team had argued that, as a result of his history with mental illness, he should not be imprisoned in a general correctional facility, but rather a hospital. The judge ruled against this request, saying that the murders and attacks were very methodical, rational, and calculating. He just used his mental illness as an excuse. His sentencing was welcomed by the relatives of the victims, even though their lives were changed forever, having lost sons, husbands, and fathers, and survivors remaining with lifetime scars. Joseph's family, though, did not take his sentencing lying down. As Joseph was being walked down towards the cell to start his jail term, they told him this was not the end. They would later appeal his verdict, as they felt that his mental illness was not taken into account during his sentencing, but the appeal failed, and Pindele Joseph Jongwana still remains in prison. Okay fam, this is where we ended today with this case. This was the longest I have done so far. It was also quite um, tedious to research and put together, because it was one of the most famous cases when it happened, so everyone has written something about it. I took the info from the sources I deem more reliable than others, so it is likely that there may be some info that is left out in this video or something that is not correct. If this is the case, please feel free to leave a comment down below to correct, add, or just, you know, state your opinion in this case. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your way out. Thank you guys. See you next Monday.